Good morning. Start the last lecture of 246. So, uh, uh, to this, uh, so basically, Fourier transform is not going to be part of the final exam. But as I said, uh, a lot of you guys who are going to civil, uh, also those who are going to mechanical, uh, you're probably not going to learn Fourier transform anymore. So we'll just uh, uh, touch upon the Fourier transform and uh, see if you can remember anything in the future, right? Yeah. OK, so Fourier transform basically de um, deals with aperiodic function. All right. So in our previous lecture, uh, we we have been dealing with Fourier series, right? For uh, Fourier series, we know what it ha what happens, but uh, for a, a periodic function or signal, okay. So here here is a a periodic function. Let's say signal at a here, okay. Then what we do is we do a little approximation at a here. So we construct. A periodic function, okay, out of this uh, a periodic one here. So basically, right? Okay. So then make sure that, okay, the period, okay, is t naught at here, and also try not to make them uh, overlap with each other, right? Yeah. So apparently, what happens is that we find out then if we take a limit process, basically if we let the period go to infinite, so essentially you expand the, the interval between two adjacent uh, uh, pulses or waves that are here, right? So all you left or all, all you can see is just this f of t now, right? So if you change this t now to infinite, then all you see is f of t. So then <coughs> there comes the idea now. Uh, we're taking limit process for this periodic function. So let's write down this Fourier series for this periodic function, right? And for Fourier series, this f of t naught, this is a periodic function. So we can write down this uh, Fourier series for this one here. And for Fourier series, this one here, let's, I'm going to use this uh, the complex form, okay, for this Fourier series. Okay, C n at here, E j n omega naught t. <coughs> so that's the Fourier series for uh, this f t naught t. Okay, the C n at here, okay, if you recall that the C n is basically one over t naught. Okay, integral t naught over two, t naught over two, f of t. Okay, f of f t naught here e negative j n omega naught t dt. So that's the coefficient, that's the formula for the coefficient c n at here. So half of t naught is probably here, and half of t naught over here, okay, so negative this. Okay, so that's basically uh, the Fourier series for the periodic function here, okay, yeah. Now let's do this, let's plug this c n over here, okay, back into uh, the original f of t naught. Okay, so let's see. So f of t naught t, okay, will equal okay, the total sum one over t naught. Okay. So that's what will happen after you plug it back to this uh, periodic function here. Okay. okay, so then there's a little confusion in here basically is this. So this integral is about uh, w variable t at here, right? And then there's another t at here. In order to 
uh, <coughs> to uh, differentiate this a little bit here, let's change this t t t at here, okay? This integral here to a different domain variable. Let's change that to tau, okay? Just to to uh, cause a little less confusion uh, with this t. So, because the dummy variable, so you can really uh, change that to any variables you want. Okay, so. Is that good? Yeah, so far, there's really nothing new yet, right? It's just basically a pure opera a manipulation based on the periodic uh, signal here, okay, for the Fourier series. Okay, so now we're going to take this limiting process, okay? Take the limiting process. So we're going to have this t naught go to infinite. Let's think about, let's observe what happens when t naught goes to infinite, okay? Yeah. Number one, okay, uh, let's uh, find what's the relationship between omega naught and the t naught. We know that it's this, right? It's this. Okay, so uh, basically as t naught goes to infinite, then this omega naught goes to zero, right? Goes to zero. So omega naught becomes very small. And omega naught represents the frequency there. Okay? Yeah. And second of all, okay, second of all, let's take a second look at this C N net here. Okay? This is the C N here, right? This C N. Now if you recall actually we were talking about this uh, Fourier series transform uh, Fourier series expansion here and uh, we mentioned about the CN here, so what we're saying is uh, CN is typically a complex number, so uh, what we generally do is, so for CN, so what we generally do is we plot CN, so basically this CN equal to its magnitude and uh, multiply by its angle, right, the complex number, okay, or the other way writing it is this, okay, there's certain angle at it here, okay. Now, when we plot this guy here, if you remember the way we plot this thing here, let's say I'm going to plot C n, okay, then this is a vertical axis, okay, the horizontal axis is what? It's n omega naught, right? n omega naught. So you plot C n, let's say you're plotting C1. So you're basically plotting C1, this is C1 here, so this, this here would be omega naught, so it's 1 multiplied by omega naught. You're plotting C2, then this is two omega naught like this. Okay, that's how we. That's how you plot the uh, absolute value. Okay, so that's basically how you generate the plot of the CN. So this is basically a plot of what we call uh, actually so-called spectrum. <coughs> okay, a spectrum here. Right. So you you t you see there is a signal giving a time signal. There's always a spectrum associated with a uh, time signal, okay? Yeah. So let's see, t actually you think about a very simple example. Let's see if I have a, just a sine uh, 2t, okay? So it's just sine 2t. Then when it comes to the spectrum for this magnitude here, what would you bet? You, you actually would only have just only one magnitude, which is corresponding to what angle for, for, the, for the omega, which is 2. Right? If it's sine, just simple, just one period, sine sine 2t, just one frequency, which is omega equal to 2, and you will only have one, basically, uh, vertical lines there, which is at omega equal to 2. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so, coming back here, so basically, here's what happens here. This is what I say, maybe, if I look at this uh, a plot of Cn, so then so Cn at here, essentially, you can think of this Cn as a function, Okay, function of n omega naught, right? It's a function. So as n varies, as omega naught varies, you plot it versus n omega naught. So then I'm going to call this is basically omega. Because this is essentially the omega axis, right? This omega axis, the frequency axis. So this guy is a function of omega equal to n omega naught. So here comes the interesting part now. As Tn goes to infinite, then omega n goes to zero. So let's, I'll give, show you an example here. Let's observe what's the variation of, in terms of the plot for this uh, magnitude Cn. So here is an example here, show you, okay? So the first graph, basically there's a pulse set here and the period is two, 
right? Now the second one here period is four, the third one is eight, then the next one is 16. So you, you don't even see it now in this uh, uh, scale at here, right? Okay. So now basically what happens is this is uh, the process as t, as the t naught, right? As the period goes to infinite, goes to large number, right? So you end up with this aperiodic function at here, essentially t is large. So now let's observe, okay? In terms of the plot of Cn, then what happens? Okay, yeah. So here's a plot. Okay, so basically after Fourier series expansion, this is your C Cn value here. Okay, so we are plotting versus this guy. So this is what happens here. For the period t equal to two, this is the plot of a C uh, the uh, a magnitude. The two here basically means this uh, the uh, the period multiplied by the state k, it kind of normalize this plot here. Okay, yeah. So all the plots okay, are looking at the same scale, omega scale, basically roughly be between negative 3 pi to 3 pi here. Okay, so as you can see, when t equal to 2, here's a plot. You have pretty sp spread it or sparse uh, this, this spectrum here, right? But as t equal to 4, t equal to 8, t equal to 16, so as t is increasing the period, so you have a very, basically, lots of lines here now, right? Is that's, that's the idea here. Or in other words, from here to here, what you f the, the way you feel is, this is more of a discrete, right? You know, basically one by one. But as the t is increasing, this is more feel like what? A continuous knot, right? It basically feels more of a continuous knot. So it's, that's the basically the effect of the t going to infinite here. Your plot of the C in that here become imagine t goes to infinite. You would you would expect yourself basically becomes a, a, a continuous curve now, right? Continuous curve. Okay, so that's the effect t t not t not go to inf infinite here. Basically, coming back here. T, when t naught goes to infinite, not just omega naught goes to n uh, goes to zero here. The other effect here is this n omega naught here give you a sense of a continuous variation at here. Okay, yeah. So now let's do this. I'm gonna basically okay, so I'll move this down a little bit. So we're going to let okay, delta w over equal to omega naught. So why am I letting delta w equal to omega naught? Coming back to this graph here. If you look at the, the difference or the interval between two adjacent, okay, two adjacent amplitude plots, what are they? They're basically omega naught. Okay, they're basically omega naught. Anything here is also omega naught. Okay, omega naught. Right? That makes sense because as t goes to infinite, the omega naught becomes zero. Okay, so we're gonna let delta w equal to omega naught, okay, like this. Okay, so then uh, for for this expression at here, okay, for this expression, so we're gonna do a little manipulation now. Okay, coming back to this equal sign here, replace this t naught. Okay, replace the t naught with omega naught at here. Okay, so. So if omega naught equal to two pi over t naught, so that means t naught equal to two pi uh, one over t naught equal to omega naught over t two pi, right? Okay. So we're gonna replace this one over t naught with omega naught over two pi. So I can take the two pi to the front out of here. Okay, and this one over t naught is omega, is omega naught here. I'm letting omega naught equal to delta omega, so I'll put the delta omega at the end there. That's delta omega, okay? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so this is right now everything's just simply sort of a, a exchange of uh, uh, variables here. Okay, so nothing changed actually. Okay, so the omega naught. Okay, basically this is omega naught, but I'm letting it equal to delta omega. Okay, yeah. So now let's see what happens when t naught goes to infinite. If t naught goes to infinite, these two limits becomes Right, negative infinite to positive infinite. Okay, and delta omega naught. Okay, as t naught goes to infinite, t naught goes to infinite, omega naught goes to zero. Delta omega naught basically becomes d omega naught. Right, d omega naught. Okay, becomes infinite infinitesimal small quantity. Okay. And this omega, right, this is omega equal to n omega naught at here. So this n omega naught, okay, this n omega naught at here, right, as we depicted using an example, it basically becomes omega, right? So at the same time, remember your n goes from negative infinite to positive infinite. So that process will make this n omega naught into omega, okay, into a continuous frequency, okay, continuous frequency. And the summation at here, your basic summation here, infinite, depth infinite, so the summation becomes an integral, right? So this whole thing at here, okay, can be written now, okay, as one over two pi. So this becomes integral now, okay. And inside of here, there's another integral. Okay. And this f of t naught tau, then what happens when, when what happens when t naught goes to infinite? As we were saying, the f t naught t goes to f t, right? F t. So overall, right, you can see now, so that everything we started with f of t naught t equal to this whole chunk. Then as t naught goes to infinite, this guy becomes f of t. So what we have in the end, basically this is f of t equal to 1 over 2 pi this, f of t at here, e negative j omega, t, omega tau. Okay. Yeah, let's use, a, let's use a tau here. d tau, okay. and e j omega t and d omega. Okay, so now we got ourselves okay, a kind of a brand new expression here. Okay, so that's f of t. Okay, so this this thing here seems to be okay, pretty strange, but uh, we're gonna use a little uh, notation right here to simplify this. Okay, yeah. So now you can see inside here there's a big bracket which is this term here, right? Which is this term. So we're gonna let okay, let something equal to this middle one here. Now because I'm single this out here, so I'm gonna change this tau back to t. Okay. So what I'm gonna let this one equal to is we're gonna let so called capital F of omega equal to this. Because if you look at this one here, what's coming out of this integral, the t will disappear, right? The t will disappear. So all you're gonna left with is gonna be a function of uh, omega. So actually sometimes, some textbook, they call this f of j omega. So they consider this thing here, okay, as this. Okay. All right, so this guy here is what we call the Fourier transform. Okay, Fourier transform. So in other words, if I plug this Fourier transform back over here, then this f of t equal to one over two pi, negative infinite, positive infinite, f of omega, e j omega t, d omega. So this is called inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so that's basically Fourier transform. Where is from?
it, it's from basically Fourier series, right? As a matter of fact, a Fourier transform is a sort of a generalized of a Fourier series because it's under the condition as T naught goes to infinite, right? Yeah. And what's the difference between Fourier transform and the Fourier series is Fourier series gives you a discrete sense. But Fourier transform, you look at this one here, it gives you a continuous. Basically, this guy is a continuous function right here. It's a function what? Function of omega, right? It's function of omega. Uh, the usage of this Fourier transform is very much like a Fourier series. Basically, what we do is for, for this f of omega out of here, this is a complex number, okay? This is a complex number. So if it's a complex number, then f of omega can be expressed, okay, using that the notation, using a magnitude and an angle, okay? The angle basically is this guy, okay? So then people what generally do is they plot this guy and plot the phi versus the frequency, okay? So you plot okay, this f of omega and phi and versus omega. Now what you obtain from the plot is so-called frequency okay, response or frequency plot. Okay, frequency plot. So this is a very important information, right? Very important. So giving a time signal. <coughs> and you, you, you won't be able to see behind what's going on in the time signal. But if you do a tra Fourier transform and you plot this magnitude and the angle versus the frequency, you can immediately see what frequency is in the, in the signal and what's the magnitude corresponding to the frequency. Basically, is that important? That contribution in the frequency is that important or not, right? If not, then you basically you neglect it. You can see maybe all oh, the, 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 the majority of the frequency or the majority of the power is concentrated, focused on the frequency of omega to 10 hertz, right? So that can be easily to tell, okay, from this plot here. So, which is why Fourier transform, okay, and this is a very, very important application in electrical system, particularly signal processing, okay? Yeah, so that's Fourier transform here, okay? So uh, typically what happens next is uh, we're going to take Fourier transform of some typical functions, right? So just like Laplace. So what's the unit step uh, signal Fourier transform? Uh, what's the uh, sinusoidal? What's exponential? What's the uh, other things, okay? Yeah. So now there is a shortcut here okay, between Fourier transform and uh, Laplace transform though. Now, if you remember Laplace transform, what was that? It's uh, zero to <coughs> this, this, right? Of this, okay? So we take wh what we have here is a so-called single-sided because we're dealing with a uh, uh, we are dealing with a uh, uh, a causal function, okay? Yeah. Now, if you look at this guy here, this s here, this is called f of s here, right? F of s here. If I replace this s with negative, not a negative, replace S with G omega, okay? Then what happens? If I replace the S with G omega here, we got this Fourier transform, right? However, that essentially is not a very rigorous replacement. So in, in uh, mathematics, there, there is a certain constraints here. You can't do just simply re replacement. But there's a connection here, okay, between this Laplace transform and Fourier transform. So usually what happens is for Laplace, Okay, you use in controls engineers, control applications. <coughs> okay, control applications. For Fourier, you use it in signal processing applications. Yeah. So both of them are very important uh, applications. Okay. So take a look at the lecture notes regarding some of the contents here. Okay. Uh, for this is, I mean, this is a little bit too short time to cover uh, such an important topic, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. So um, um, we'll just, uh, uh, in case you're in interested, right? And uh, let me know. Okay. Okay. So let's do a quick review at it here in terms of the whole course, right? Yeah. Uh, first of all, so what do we test? What does the uh, final exam cover? Okay.
So in short, okay, the fun exam covers lecture 15 to lecture 32. Okay? Yeah. So use the equal sign here, okay? So basically, uh, lecture 15 is what we left with uh, from the uh, midterm, okay? and the lecture 32 is the Fourier series. Okay? Uh, <coughs> starting lecture 15, okay, that's basically the first order differential equation. Okay? And uh, we're not going to retest this first order, uh, solving first order differential equation using inter integrating factor <coughs> methods. However, you do need to know that though, because in the lecture 15 and 16, essentially L15 and 16, we covered uh, two different uh, first order differential equation. If you remember, one is called homogeneous. Okay? Homogeneous equation. Basically, y prime equal to fxy. And it just happened that this fxy okay, can be written okay, in this kind of format. Okay? Or y over x. Okay? Yeah. Actually, y over x. That doesn't matter. Okay? Or you can call it another function, capital Y, a capital F, or Y over X. Okay, so that, for example, Y prime equal to uh, just simply maybe just uh, uh, X square over X square plus Y square. Okay. So there's a big line there. Okay, for example, Y prime equal to this. And if you divide both the numerator denominator by x squared, this is what? 1 over 1 plus y over x squared, right? So this type of uh, equation is called homogeneous equation. And when you solve this one here, basically you're going to let uh, u equal to y over x, and then change the original differential equation into the new differential equation into the u, right? And then you solve the u first. After you solve the u, then you solve the y, which is equal to ux. So that's the uh, homogeneous one, right? Yeah. And the second one here is, is the Bernoulli's equation. Okay, Bernoulli equation. So for Bernoulli equation, because this is a little far from now, so I, I'll just write it down here as a stroke of your mind here, okay? Yeah. Okay, this is a Bernoulli equation, okay? Um, N is not zero. And n is not 1, if you remember that. Otherwise, it won't be a Bernoulli equation. Bernoulli equation basically is a nonlinear equation. Okay? And that's also nonlinear there, too. So for Bernoulli equation, what, what you do is basically you can let okay, u equal to 1 over y to the power of uh, n minus 1. Okay? And uh, this is basically y1 minus n. Then you're gonna take derivative of both sides there, right? And find the derivative and transform the original differential equation into a first order differential equation in terms of the u, and it'll become a linear now. Then you solve the u back here, solve the y, right? Okay, so that kind of detail, okay, rely on the lecture notes. But in this Bernoulli equation, okay, you do you do need to use integrating factor methods. In the end, you, this integrating factor method is involved in terms of solving Bernoulli equation, right? Yeah. So this is basically the two type of, of uh, first order differential equation that's going to be covered, okay, or possibly tested in a final exam. Okay, that's that's basically lecture 15 and 16. Okay. Yeah. And then for complex number. Okay, so we talk a complex number, and this is lecture 17 and 18. Okay. So complex number is uh, more or less of uh, um, uh, essentials for uh, future applications of solving second order differential equation and then Fourier series and something like uh, others, right? Yeah. So we, we probably won't test this very dedicated question in this part here, but there are a couple of things very important in this, in this part of lecture is uh, first of all, the Euler's formula, that's very important. Okay. 
So the E J theta equal to cosine theta plus J sine theta, right? Okay. So that's important for a meter. Okay. And the other thing is uh, that concept, so-called phaser. Okay. So phaser essentially is you have two sinusoidal signal with the same frequency. How do we represent the two together into one sinusoidal function? Right. That's what will happen when. Uh, when we're using the phaser there, okay. So, it's this is important because in the future when you're solving AC circuit, okay, you inevitably will use these phaser things here, okay. Yeah. And the other one is the nth root. So last year I tested this concept, the nth root. Okay. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at your uh, uh, formula sheet, the second page, uh, which uh, has this nth root of a complex number, the formula there, right? So, understand how to use this one here, okay? How do you find nth root of a complex number? Okay? Yeah. So, first of all, when you say complex number, you got to understand is complex number, not just the A plus J B. If you have a real number a or negative three or neg or one, right? All of this are complex number, right? A complex number. So if you're trying to find nth root of this complex number, nth root basically let's say fourth root, fifth root. So it depends on the number n here. Basically, you should expect yourself to have that number of uh, solutions, right? Yeah. Was that good? So take a look at the lecture notes, okay? Uh, and assignments that you have down this part here, okay? So this, those are important uh, subjects here in this complex number uh, lectures. Okay. And then there comes this uh, big topic which we spend a lot of time on the second order, okay? Uh, differential equation. Okay. So this is from lecture 19 to 26, okay? So there are uh, eight lectures got involved with this one here, right? Yeah, so you should expect there are uh, going to be uh, quite a few uh, questions out of this uh, second order differential solving second order differential equations. Okay, uh, in order to jog your mind into here, okay, there there are uh, quite a few uh, concepts going involved. And uh, there's L I L D, basically a linear independent linear dependent concept going involved first. Right? Yeah, and then uh, when it comes to solution. Okay, we had uh, two different uh, uh, type here. One is homogeneous. The other is non-homogeneous. Okay, homogeneous basically means there's no a force or no input to the differential equation, so the equal sign is zero on the other side. The non-homogeneous is equal to certain function, right? For homogeneous one, what you do is you need to basically find the characteristic equation, okay? Solve for the roots, right? Solve for the roots. And then, based on the roots, you will have to see that you're going to have probably three different cases of the kind of roots, right? Because we're mainly dealing with the second order here. So you either have uh, two distinct roots to repeat double, uh, double roots or uh, a pair of conjugate roots. Then what is the basically Right, the general solution. So you do have, um, yeah, the formula sheet do give you one there. Okay, yeah, right, general solutions. Okay, that's homogeneous. That's easy. And non-homogeneous one solution is based on the homogeneous. Non-homogeneous y equal to y p plus y h. So if this is a y h shadow here, okay and you already have YH, all you need is to figure out a YP. <coughs> and in terms of the YP, and we have two different approach, right? One is called the, lu the lucky guess method, or the more formal name, which is called undetermined coefficient method. And the other method is a, a variation of parameters. Okay, yeah. So for both methods, the, ta the the formula should give you this one here now. Variation parameters is there. The uh, uh, lucky guess 
give you there. However, you got to be careful though, huh? The lucky guess I give you there is only initial choice. Okay. So what happened after your initial choice? What do you have to do? Sorry. One. Modify or modify by t possibly or even by t squared. Right? If you have a summation of two function over there, then there's another one called summation rule, right? So that's what you need to be careful. That rule I don't put I don't put it here in the in the formula sheet, but you need to realize that okay, you, your your job is not just simply uh, take a look at the table, take a lucky guess, right? There's uh, two more steps to go to uh, make sure no mistakes. So <coughs> And we have also applications. Basically, we have free vibrations and forced vibrations. Okay, forced vibrations. So in these two uh, two parts of the lectures, there, uh, there we're basically making use of the mastering damper system to illustrate the idea of this uh, the system response from a second order differential equation. Right? Yeah. So understand in this part here, you know, those symbols, what are those symbols basically omega n, zeta, omega d, uh, what do they represent? And uh, how do you differentiate the kind of a system based on the zeta value, right? If you remember for the zeta value, we have three different names, right? We have this underdamped, we have this uh, critically damped, we have this over adapt. Okay? Yeah. So giving a system, so you should be able to tell what kind of system do you have. Do you have a free vibration system? And, and by the way, what what how do you differentiate whether you have a free vibration system? Sorry, someone. Is it homogeneous equation, right? Yeah. And then uh, how about uh, next one? Uh, what 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 would you call it? Um, <laughs> Um, uh, what would you call it? On damp system. B equals zero. B equals zero. Exactly. Right. So that kind of thing, right? Free vibration with homogeneous no input. Force vibration with input. And uh, uh, on damp basically when B is zero. Right. Okay. Yeah. And when when you have under damp system, the zeta value must be less than one and equal to 1, greater than 1. And what is the relationship between basically these three things? What are the relationships between the coefficients of this DE, right? So how do you uh, relate this information, right? Yeah. So get, get, get to know that. I, I didn't put the formula in there, but I think uh, uh, that's not very bad. It's very can, you can just look at it and easy to verify. I think one of the assignments uh, asks you to do that, right? Okay. Okay, so those are basically uh, the uh, second order differential equation. Then we have this uh, uh, Laplace transform. Okay. And that goes from lecture 27 to 31. Okay, yeah, to 31. So for the Laplace transform, okay, what the essential skill that you, you have to is you are able to look for uh, this table here, right? Look at this table. Okay, understand that in this table we're dealing with basically causal function. Okay, so the first uh, uh, the first column and the third column. Okay, so essentially they are actually all referring to causal function. Okay, yeah. So if you multiply each one of the function with a u of t. And that's basically what happens there, right? Yeah. So the table is one thing. Okay. Of course, uh, before you're able to use a table, understand the concept, understand uh, some of the properties of the Laplace transform. Okay. A couple properties I think are very important is that derivative property. Derivative. Derivative. Right. Yeah. Okay, the derivative property. Basically, uh, what's the Laplace transform of dy over dt? What's the Laplace transform of dy, uh, second order dy over dt? Okay, yeah. And uh, there's another one, it's the time shifting property. Okay. 
Okay, those properties are all in the table, though, huh? Yeah. So by the way, if you look at the table, which one is the time shifting property? That's right. Yeah. So for this property, you should be able, you should be very comfortable with either direction, right? In the assignment number, is it nine? Assignment number nine, the last question. So you use the Laplace transform to solve a, solve a differential equation when it has a piecewise input, right? So basically that question is making use of that time shifting property there, right? So get comfortable with this uh, property there, okay? And actually one of the first assignment number eight, I think, or maybe no, no, still number nine, uh, there, there is a, asking you what's a Laplace transform a certain function, right? And it's e to the power of something u multiplied by u uh, something, right? So for that one there, uh, you also need probably also you need to use the, this time shifting property to derive this uh, corresponding Laplace transform. Uh, one of the important applications is we use okay, Laplace to solve second order differential equation. Okay, so sec second order differential. So this is basically going to be a tested uh, uh, material. Okay, it's actually very important, so we're going to definitely test this material here. Okay, but a couple of things you need to be careful in this particular case is when you use the Laplace to solve. Okay, bear in mind that the diagram or the flow of this uh, working process. So you're taking Laplace of the original time function into the S domain, then you decompose this. Uh, S function into simplest form that you can look it up from the table, then you convert it back to this time domain, right? That's the process. But during the process, the decomposition, there are three different different cases, right? So uh, what what uh, decomposition? Okay. So when you have a simple pose, when you have a complex pose, complex conjugate pose. Sorry about my writing here. Just here. and the last one here when you have a repeated pose. Okay, how do, how would you partial fraction expansion? Okay, basically how would you decompose? The decompose here basically means partial fraction expansion. Okay, how would you do that to get to this simplest format? So you take a look at the lecture notes to each one of the cases there. Right? How would you decompose? In particular, for this complex conjugate roots, decomposing is okay, but there's a, there is a tricky step there. You, you have to manipulate it accordingly so that you can look for the table, right? Look at the corresponding uh, items on the table. Okay, so that part of the skill uh, you got to be able to uh, to uh, master there, right? Okay, so that's Laplace. And in the end, there is this uh, uh, there is this trans function concept. Okay, trans function. So trans function is Laplace of the output over Laplace of the input. Now there is a very important assumption when we're trying to get the Laplace uh, when we're trying to get the trans function. What's the assumption there? Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So don't ask me the question. And uh, the question asks you, what's the trans function? And uh, you would uh, say, oh, oh well, uh, well, can you tell me the initial condition? No, I can't. Right. So just bear in mind what's the reason I will say I can't. Okay. And if the question gave you initial condition, then ignore it if this is looking for trans function. Right. But when you're looking for the solution, then you will have to use the initial condition. Right. So that's basically understand this uh, connection here. Uh, last bullet is the Fourier series, which we well we just covered. Okay, Fourier series. So we're not going to uh, test the Fourier series in complex form. Only the Fourier series uh, in the uh, uh, the trigonometry kind of formats. All right. Yeah. So basically up to lecture 32. Okay, 32 there. So anyway, that's basically all the topic, right? If you look at uh, are those topics, actually not much, isn't it, right? So the uh, uh, when you prepare, okay, so prepare accordingly. Uh, make sure you understand all the concepts. Okay. Uh, this is important uh, because usually you will so overwhelmed, so uh, basically jammed there, right? Yeah. I'll make sure myself is available, okay, during the next week. Yeah.
So anyway, thank you very much, guys, and it's been a pleasure. Right? Uh, we don't need to. Don't need no. to. Yeah.